coming from that. All right. So I'm going to talk about the evaluation and treatment of scapular dyskinesis um, with uh, the supporting evidence in mind. So just a little preview of what I'm going to talk about is uh, we'll look at some evaluation techniques, both static and dynamic, as well as classifications of scapular dyskinesis that have been described in the literature, um, particular manual correction techniques or methods for uh, scapular dyskinesis, as well as various treatment uh, options. So just to kind of uh, forecast as well, I'm not going to break this up into post-operative patients and non-operative patients. I'm going to kind of group everything together. Dr. Spear already talked about those individuals in that last procedure that he would perform where the bones were moved and all those muscles and their subsequent tendons had to be replaced and they're sling for eight weeks before they begin therapy, then that's when you start to deal with some of these problems. So all those things with the treatment that I'm going to talk about can sort of be lumped together under the same principles. So I might interject a few things specific to post-operative patients, but for the most part, these principles and treatment methods are, are working well with, with one another in both instances. So the challenge of uh, the evaluation piece with scapular dyskinesis is present for a number of different reasons. One is, as Kerry talked about, this, the scapula moves in three different planes with all kinds of muscles surrounding it, uh, overlying soft tissue, which makes it difficult to visualize the scapula and any subtle inconsistencies with normal scapular kinematics. So this is why it's imperative that any individual you suspect having scapular dyskinesis or scapular-based pain, that their shoulder is exposed. So female patients are either in a gown or in a sports bra where you can see that scapula, and male patients with their shirt off so you can get a, a good visual uh, of that scapula. And then trying to determine whether or not that pain is scapular-based or cervical-based. Uh, scapular-based pain, as Dr. Spear talked about, can sometimes mimic or mirror that of cervical-based pain. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that we're actually going to be working with scapular-based pain and not something that's coming from the cervical spine. <clears throat> so uh, a comprehensive evaluation with uh, upper quarter screen should be able to detect whether or not you think the, the pain's coming from the cervical spine or the scapula. But if there's some confusion, it seems like ridiculous symptoms, but it's not classic ridiculous symptoms from the cervical spine. It feels more like scapular-based pain. An easy test is a cervical distraction test. It has good diagnostic value and is very specific at diagnosing uh, cervical radiculopathy. And it's a very simple test to perform. So during your upper quarter screen or evaluation, their symptoms are assessed and noted where, how often, with repeated motions if it worsens or, or lessens. And then you have them in supine, and the clinician using a chin cradle grip here applies a distraction force on the cervical spine and their symptoms are then reassessed afterwards. If there's a reduction in symptoms or their pain is diminished, then it's cervical-based uh, pain. And you kind of want to head towards that direction, refer back, or start dealing with the cervical spine and not the, the scapula. So the way I kind of delve into this, um, and we'll, we'll start here, is that following normal shoulder exam, if I suspect that the scapula is causing some of the pain or that there's some scapular dyskinesis, then I'll sort of head into a more specific evaluation of their scapula. So that's kind of where we'll, we'll start here. Um, so the lateral scapular slide test, probably a test that most of you are familiar with. It's one of the, the first uh, talked about tests for the, the scapula and one of the first and, and only for a while in the literature. And it's described initially by Kibler et al., and what it is, is you're measuring the distance between the inferior angle of the scapula to the adjacent spinous process in centimeters on both sides, bilaterally, in three different positions. First position, patient's arms are at rest by their side, measured both sides. Second, the arms abducted to 45 degrees, and the uh, shoulder is also immediately rotated, so hands on their hips, basically. And then final position is 90 degrees of shoulder abduction and fully medially rotated. So you're taking six, me six measurements here, both sides and three different ones. So this is a static um, evaluation of the scapula, which is the first problem with this test. It's not a dynamic test, so you have no idea about the muscles and their activation and how they hold that scapula where it needs to be with its motion. Um, a distance of greater than 1.5 centimeters 
compared bilaterally is considered pathologic or, or a dyskinetic shoulder based on the lateral scapular slide test. <clears throat> Kibler initially um, described this as, as one centimeter, but later on it was changed to 1.5. So the inter-rater reliability um, of this is, is moderate of this test, but the big problem is the question of validity of this test. Because what if someone has bilateral scapular dyskinesis? Then the distance is going to be the same, and per this test, they're not going to have scapular dyskinesis when, in fact, they very well may. Um, there's been uh, other studies that help to support that questionable validity of this particular test. One was done looking at 71 asymptomatic uh, Division I collegiate uh, baseball players, not pitchers, but any position players as well. Of those 71, according to this test, 52 of them had a distance of greater than 1.5 centimeters. So 52 healthy, asymptomatic, albeit overhead athletes, having scapular dyskinesis out of 71 is a little bit unlikely. So again, questionable validity, uh, as well as it's a static evaluation of the scapula. So we want something that looks a little bit more at the dynamic um, visualization of the scapula. So again, Kibler all comes up with his scapular dyskinesis system and where he he identifies four different types of scapular dyskinesis based on what you see during scapular motion. So these pictures here are not indicative, but they're, they're going to serve as a reference of what we're looking for. So I should have that scapula a little bit more exposed to see. But type 1, according to this classification system, is where you see the inferior angle um, being more prominent, suggesting an anterior tilt of the scapula. Type 2 would be seeing a, a more prominent medial border, suggesting internal rotation of the scapula. Type 3, which I tried to illustrate here, would be an increased upward rotation of the scapula, looking at the superior border, comparing it bilaterally, um, again, indicative of that upward rotation. And then type 4 is just some symmetric uh, scapula. So, Bottom line with this classification system is that it produced very low reliability values. They looked at two specific groups um, for inter-rater reliability, and the kappa coefficients were 0.31 for one group and 0.41 for the other. So that's fair to poor um, reliability. So not a, not a very reliable test. Subsequent research, research has um, sort of confirmed that, and, and uh, Kibler will actually perform further studies identifying that, that the reliability of the values were low and we need to look for another way to better classify these uh, scapular dyskinesis uh, patients. So, current um, evaluation, visual classification of the scapula uh, in regards to scapular dyskinesis is the scapular dyskinesis test, or the SDT. So, this research was done by McClure et al. Um, and what you ask the patient to do is with a, a light weight anywhere between three and five pounds, they're asked to perform both flexion and abduction with the weight in their hands, five repetitions each time. And you look bilaterally at both scapula, and you just note whether or not it's present or absent, not whether it's winging or it's tilting or it's doing this, whether it's present or absent. He performed it on asymptomatic cohort, and this is a two-part study that was published in the Journal of Athletic Training First part, um, to identify whether or not it was a reliable uh, study. And they showed good values for reliability. And then the second part was to look at the construct validity for this test. Does it actually, uh, does someone who actually has a present, um, as rated by the clinician, actually have scapular dyskinesis? So they looked at the 3D tracking of the scapula and compared it to the rater's um, identification of either present or absent. And sure enough, what they found that most clinicians who uh, identify the scapula as, as having scapular dyskinesis, the 3D uh, tracking was also off compared to normal scapular kinematics. So this is a, a good, valid, reliable test for demonstrating, um, looking at um, scapular dyskinesis, although it was with an asymptomatic cohort. And then all it all comes along and does a yes-no system very similar to the present or absent system on both the symptomatic and asymptomatic population and gets, gets good reliability. So this, this is a, a system that works. It's uh, dynamic, and it's a, it's a simple system, present or absent, good reliability and good validity. So this is what we're currently using in the literature. It's agreed upon that this is the classification system to look at if you suspect scapular dyskinesis. Uh, 
manual correction techniques um, for scapular disconnect, dyskinesis uh, is, is to be used on symptomatic scapular dyskinesis. And the purpose of these correction techniques is to reduce the symptoms or reduce pain. So you have two manual correction techniques, the scapular assistance test or the SAT and the scapular retraction or, or um, uh, reposition test or the SRT. So the first one we'll look at is the scapular assistance <coughs> test. This again initially described by Kibler et al. So the way this is performed is the patient is asked to elevate their arm as high as they can comfortably. Their pain's noted, the rating of the pain and, and what position the shoulder was in when it's painful. Then they're asked to relax their arm. Originally it was described as simply a pro providing some assistance of the inferior border to help facilitate that um, upward rotation of the scapula as they again raise their arm into the same position. It's been modified now to provide retraction with this hand and assistance up with upper rotation of this hand and their symptoms are reassessed. So a positive test of this is reduction in pain with the assistance of retraction and uh, the elevation there with this hand down here. Now if you've had a chance to read the latest issue of JOSPT, Sites et al. looked at a study um, with this particular test so they claim, the scapular assistance test, um, and whether or not it changes rotator cuff strength, subacromial space, and uh, scapular kinematics. And what they found was that with this particular test being performed, moving the scapula with retraction and helping it up like that, is that there was a, an increase in subacromial space measured through ultrasound, that there was a change in the kinematics towards normal scapular kinematics, as well as they found no increase in strength with the rotator cuff musculature, which based on what Kerry talked about, the literature would suggest by placing it in a better position that you would get better activation of the rotator cuff. One thing that may not allude to that is they say they used the scapular assistance test, but it was done passively in the test and they didn't measure pain. Those are two key components to the scapular assistance test. It's done actively and you measure pain. So what they looked at was just the positioning of the scapula, not necessarily the actual test. The second is the scapular reposition or retraction test. So in this case, you position the patient as though you're going to test strength in the supraspinatus, and then you, you do such, you ask them to hold that position, you apply a force downward, and you assess their pain. Then you apply retraction with this hand and run through the same drill. If the pain's reduced or diminished, then it's a positive test. So what does it mean if we get a positive test with the scapular assistance or the scapular retraction test? Well, it shows us two things. One, that their pain is specifically based on scapular position. If you move that scapula and it changes their pain, then that's a good indication of treatment options that they are more likely to respond to. So it also gives us information about what treatment methods are going to be more effective for these type of patients based on those type of patients who may not have a reduction in pain following these correction methods. So strength is certainly something we want to look at during the evaluation. Um, the periscapular muscles, the rotator cuff, as well as the larger shoulder movers. Um, research looking at individuals with scapular dyskinesis uh, has revealed that the two most common muscles that are more weak are the serratus anterior and the lower trap in individuals with scapular dyskinesis. Um, and then we also see uh, an increase in activity in the upper trapezius to help with that upward rotation of the scapula, probably to get it out of the way um, to prevent impingement with some of the stuff like, like Kerry talked about. And the restrictions we're going to see in folks with scapular dyskinesis are going to be a tight pec minor and then potentially tight posterior shoulder. <coughs> So, when testing the strength in the periscapular muscles, it's not your average break test. So, typically, what you would do, and I need to have this scapula again a little bit more visual for what I'm about to say here. Um, typically, you apply the force there, whatever periscapular muscle you're testing, you know, here, here, thumbs up, thumbs down, and then down here for um, latissimus. But what you want to look for is not how well they can hold against your force, but whether or not the scapula breaks. So you need to look at the scapula, because a lot of times what will happen with weak periscapular muscles, you'll apply the force, the scapula will break, 
they'll reposition and then they can hold you a little stronger. But it identifies weakness in the periscapular muscles. So you want to look to see if that scapula breaks. If it does and they can still hold their arm there, those periscapular muscles are weak. They're just compensating some other way to hold that position. So you need to see that scapula. Or you can place a hand there too and sometimes you can feel that break in that scapula where those para periscapular muscles can't hold it there. Um, another thing too is that individuals who have very weak deltoid muscles or rotator cuff muscles, their arm may actually need to be supported and then you apply the force directly to the scapula to test the periscapular muscles, which is different than what you, you might see in, in Kindle. Um, but that's, that's something to consider when you're, you're testing the periscapular muscles is that break in the scapula as opposed to whether or not they can hold their arm out in space. Uh, posterior shoulder tightness can be measured in a few different ways, uh, supine or sideline. I prefer the sideline method as, as we're seeing here. So this is um, the star position for measuring posterior shoulder tightness and sideline. The shoulders abducted to 90 degrees, elbow flexed to approximately 90 degrees, um, and the clinician's hand here is providing a retraction force on the scapula, and that's maintained throughout the whole test and you maintain the retraction and slowly passively lower their arm into horizontal abduction and adduction and when you feel a solid end feel or you can no longer keep that scapula retracted then that's when you would take the measurement and using a, a bubble inclinometer attached to the mid, mid humerus here typically anything uh, less than 90 degrees so this being zero this being 90 degrees anything less than uh, 90 degrees is indicative of posterior shoulder tightness um, but it also gives you a good measure to take a look at this again after you've done your treatment techniques and see whether or not you were um, effective at increasing uh, posterior shoulder extensibility if you think that's part of the problem. So now we'll get into some treatment techniques looking at strengthening, stretching, uh, manipulation, mobilization, as well as taping and bracing. So strengthening. So just a few principles here that apply to most... Um, any strengthening, but some specific to the scapula as well. So definitely want to start proximal to distal. So not starting with rotator cuff strengthening, even if you detect rotator cuff weakness. If that scapula is not in a good place, that rotator cuff is going to be at a disadvantage. You're not going to get good activation of the rotator cuff, and you could potentially cause injury to the rotator cuff as well. So you want to start proximally, work distally, and start with um, static or closed chain exercises before moving to more dynamic or open chain exercises. Big thing I think with, um, at least from what I've seen, is with folks as you're progressing their strengthening program with scapular dyskinesis, so you've identified weakness maybe in other areas of the shoulder as well, but particularly in the periscapular muscles, if you move them too quickly into open chain or dynamic exercises before that scapula is well stabilized, you're going to see pain and compensatory mechanisms. It's not let's push through this pain, you know, it will get better, that sort of thing, because it's indicative of that impingement. That scapula is not in the right place. So you need to step back, work more on the static, closed chain stuff before moving into more dynamic things. Um, and the classic com compensatory mechanism is the elevation of that, that upper trap. So if that's present at all with any dynamic exercises, you head back and readdress that. Um, and then, as I, I think this is interesting, at least to me, is that with athletes as well as the general population, you want to address strength and flexibility in the lower legs and hips as well as core strength before addressing any scapular um, strengthening or rotator cuff muscle strengthening or deltoid strengthening or anything like that. Because, as, as we can see here, with a, a posterior pelvic tilt or tight hip flexors, that has a tendency to draw folks into protraction when we want them to be here. So not just hoping that this gets better by addressing this, but if this is off, this has to be addressed first before heading up here. Otherwise, you're not going to get the most bang for your buck with these type of exercises if this is still happening down here. So at least take a, take a glance at hip flexors, core strength, pelvic tilt, see where they're at there and address those things maybe even before moving on to um, static strengthening of the periscapular muscles. So th something to consider that looking down here might help you later on up here. And not just with the kinetic chain and producing force in the athlete 
an overhead athlete and that sort of thing, but just in the general population too. Um, so these two exercises, um, both isometric closed chain, good for post-operative uh, patients or patients whose shoulders are just too painful to get in particular positions to strengthen these muscles. These two exercises um, in studies that have looked at muscle activation of different exercises have shown that these two exercises, as closed chain exercises, have the highest uh, muscle activity for lower trap and serratus anterior. So these are good closed chain exercises to do. The inferior uh, isometric inferior glide is simply by trying to push inferiorly down through there, making sure they're feeling the correct muscle activation. So you might have to play around with the, the height of the table. And then um, isometric low row here to engage, again, lower trap and serratus in through there. So you're just pushing back on that table, and you might have to play around with the distance between the arm and the table and where they're at uh, forward or back. Um, but these two exercises are good for those sort of low-level folks to get in touch with their uh, periscapular muscles, if you will. More advanced exercises without pain, as we've already talked about that. The lawnmower exercise, the robbery, uh, Y's, T's, and arrows, or W's, push-ups with a pus, P and F patterns, and then uh, serratus punches. So I've got lawnmower and robbery um, sort of highlighted here because these two exercises, as dynamic exercises are concerned, show the highest activation of lower trap and serratus anterior, the two muscles that are more, more weak with folks with scapular dyskinesis. So these two exercises, as dynamic exercises, show a higher activity in, in those two muscles, but you need to be careful again because it also shows a higher activity in the upper trap if it's not addressed properly. So not moving forward too quickly to strengthen those muscles better um, at the cost of feeding into that whole pattern. So lawnmower exercise, starting position here, sort of bent over, uh, hand to the contralateral foot or as close as it to you can, and the patient's asked to slowly move back and then more forcefully as they turn contract and try and push that shoulder blade back. So it's almost like doing a row but single and coming back and getting good force towards the end here. That's a lawnmower. And then the robbery starting is, is more in a sort of a modified bent over row position and then the cues to the patient are to sort of stand upright, put their palms forward and the big cue is to put their elbows as if they're putting them in their back pockets forcefully to engage that lower trap and that serratus and try and get that scapula back up in there. Um, so again, these two exercises, high activities in the lower trap and serratus, the two weaker muscles that we see with patients who have scapular dyskinesis. This is a familiar go-to uh, set of exercises for folks who have periscapular weakness, um, Y's, T's, and arrows, or W's, great exercises for the periscapular muscles if they already have good control of them. You can see a lot of pain provocation here and compensatory mechanisms for folks who are not quite ready for these exercises. Um, but once they are, these are great exercises for those muscles. Because basically you're just putting them in the positions that you're testing them in for strength. PNF patterns, I really like um, in, in general just as a strengthening technique, but particularly with patients who have scapular dyskinesis for a couple different reasons. So this is a D1 pattern here starting and ending, and then D2 pattern starting and ending. So giving manual resistance in uh, PNF patterns allows you to control the force you're applying, and you can sort of tease out weak musculature as you're going along. You apply a little bit more force and see what happens. They elevate their trap or, or, or what happens. So it gives you a little feedback as to their, their progress or where they're at strength-wise in the shoulder, as well as it's good at, at low levels of resistance just for general strengthening and that proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Another thing I really like about this that no other scapular exercise that we talked about prior to this does is it gives the patient feedback as to what their scapula is doing. Everything else that you do prior to this we've talked about, that scapula is just out there in space. They have no idea what's going on back there. They can't visualize it. They can't look in the mirror and see it. But if you get their back up against the plinth, they can sort of feel what's going on back there, and you can use that as a, as a chance to educate them and give them some feedback as to, do you feel when that sort of lifts up or when you try and roll that shoulder up when I'm applying resistance? Let's try and keep it down. So it gives them a little bit more feedback and a chance for you to educate them about things not only to do when you're doing the PNF patterns, but things to do 
when they're doing their other exercises as well. Tightness in the posterior shoulder um, can be addressed in a number of different, re in different ways. These are probably the most effective ways of addressing posterior shoulder tightness. The first one here is a horizontal adduction with scapular stabilization. So here she's got her shoulder up against the wall to stabilize that scapula so that when you pull it into horizontal adduction, you're getting a stretch here where you want it and not between the medial board of the scapula and the spine if you just do it in space like this. So up against the wall or lying supine and performing that is going to be a lot better at increasing posterior shoulder extensibility than just doing it in space. Um, sleeper stretch, another effective way at increasing um, internal rotation as well as addressing posterior shoulder tightness. And then manual stretching techniques where you're stabilizing that scapula, moving them to horizontal abduction, and also uh, anterior to posterior mobilizations are very effective in the right position for increasing extensibility in the posterior shoulder. The pec minor, um, another thing we identified as being tight in these individuals in the literature. Um, Morstad et al. did a study looking at these three stretching techniques for increasing extensibility in the pec minor. So they looked at the unilateral doorway stretch or wall stretch, the supine uh, foam roll or towel stretch, and the manual technique where this hand's pushing that way, that hand's pushing that way, hold and get a stretch on the pec. Any guesses on which one's most effective at gaining extensibility in the pec minor? Foam roll? Foam roll? Actually, unilateral wall stretch followed by foam roll in asymptomatic folks. One problem with this in folks who have impingement, they may not be able to comfortably get up into that position, right? You've experienced that, I'm sure. So you have them lower down and do that but you get away from the orientation of the fibers, so the stretch is less effective um, as opposed to up and through here. So one thing I like to do in clinic, who knows whether it's good or bad, this is just anecdotal, um, is I modify this when the patient's in prone and I'm doing any kind of thoracic uh, spine work or soft tissue work to the periscapular muscles, is I'll, I'll modify this, I'll use this hand to really drive down into the plinth, and I'll use the other hand to pull up and stretch out that pec. So for what it's worth, I find that to be most effective in folks who have pain in doing this. Once they can get up to this point, this is the better stretch for them to do. Even though you feel like the other side isn't, you know, isn't anchored like it might be in a corner stretch, this seems to be a little bit more effective. Manipulations um, or mobilizations of the thoracic spine. Um, a lot of research done out there, a lot of it by Cleland et al., um, looking at the effect of thoracic manipulations or mobilizations on the shoulder. It's been shown to be effective at reducing shoulder pain, increasing shoulder mobility, increasing scapular mobility, improving posture, and actually increasing strength immediately after thoracic um, manipulations in uh, the lower trap. And the, the thought behind that, the mechanism, is that the lower trap's inhibited with increased thoracic kyphosis, and the manipulation helps to decrease that thoracic kyphosis and allow the, uh, the lower trap to work a little bit better. Uh, Malthadol also did a study looking at um, the strength of elevation of the shoulder isometrically following thoracic manipulation, and he found a 26% increase in strength immediately with isometric flexion following thoracic manipulation. Whether those effects are long-term or not, manipulation um, the studies haven't really been done looking at long-term effects in thoracic manipulations in regards to the shoulder. So just a few uh, manipulation techniques, uh, the pistol manipulation. Um, so this is the hand position for this hand that actually goes up along the spine. This is for uh, upper thoracic manipulation, so the spinous process lying in through here. The concordant segment of the segment you're interested in up through here, and then the thrust is applied through the, the clinician's chest, through the humeral shaft in this direction quick thrust and it needs to be a lot of force through the chest to get that one to go right. Um, the screw manipulation for the lower uh, thoracic spine using a pisiform grip is shown here and the force directed directly posterior to anterior. And then the distraction manipulation, um, patient in this position sitting or standing, probably better sitting and long sitting and the force is applied superiorly and anteriorly, being 
careful not to provide extension in the thoracic spine, it's superior and anterior. Mobilizations um, can be effective with the glenohumeral joint, um, you know, reducing pain, improving mobility. Um, we talked about posterior, uh, anterior to posterior mobilizations and helping to improve extensibility in the posterior shoulder. But what we're really after, what Dr. Spear alluded to earlier, are the mobilizations of the, of the scapula uh, with these particular patients. So for me, I like this position um, because it gives me both hands on the scapula. They're in side line. They can relax their arm. This arm back here, the patient puts their thumb through my belt loop, and they can relax their arm, and then I've got free reign over their, their scapula. Research shows us that it doesn't matter in the direction that you mobilize the scapula. Any direction helps to improve scapula mobility. And as Dr. Spear mentioned, in this position, you can effectively even get up underneath there and create some scapular distraction, um, but best done in that chicken wing position. Um, a lot of massage therapists will do that with folks who have uh, periscapular pain, put them in that position, get deep in there and sort of pull up, and I think those techniques work, work really well as well. Um, taping. Um, there's early evidence to support that taping helps with um, improving posture and getting that scapula positioned right. Uh, it works best through the literature we see um, in individuals that respond well to that scapular reposition or retraction test, uh, individuals that have poor posture, and then it's a good adjunct to the comprehensive approach that we talked about earlier. Now you'll see a lot of different um, taping methods, taping colors, and all that business um, out there. The one that's best supported by the literature is the one described by Greg et al., where the stiff tape is first anchored to the anterior portion of the uh, chromioclavicular joint, pulled across the scapula over T6, and then the intersection is uh, at T6 right there. And the thought is helping to improve that posture, whether it comes from feedback, from just having the tape on there that they feel they need to improve their posture, or if there's actually some benefit from having that tape on there that it mechanically changes something in there. That's unknown at this point. And then soft tissue, as we probably have experienced ourselves as well as patients, those parascapular muscles, those broad, flat muscles, very um, likely to have trigger points in them, particularly in folks who have scapular dyskinesis. Um, Braun et al. did a study just looking at patients who have shoulder pain, not scapular dyskinesis, shoulder pain, versus those who don't have shoulder pain. So a significant um, difference between the number of both latent and active trigger points in those individuals with shoulder pain. Um, those individuals with shoulder pain, 77% had active trigger points in the infraspinatus, 58% had active trigger points in the upper trapezius. Um, I would imagine if we were to sort of break those categories down, which they didn't really allude to in the study, that if it was scapular dyskinesis, we'd probably see more along the rhomboids, middle trap, as well as with that upper trapezius due to its compensatory mechanism to help out there. Um, so with that, any, any trigger point techniques, uh, deep tissue massage, um, or soft tissue mobilizations, I should say. Um, ultrasound on, on continuous heat, with a little overpressure on the ultrasound head, um, as well as for that, that pain that sort of radiates up, those tight musculature up and through here, um, suboccipital release uh, is very effective at reducing that sort of pain, that tightness up there in that fascia, as well as just manual levator and upper trapezius uh, stretching with the patient supine head supported is also very effective almost immediately. So in conclusion, we looked at normal and abnormal scapular kinematics, different classification systems, and which one we consider to be appropriate to use at this time with regards to reliability and validity of scapular dyskinesis, a comprehensive um, examination, and that progressive thoughtful treatment program, not moving too far too fast before those parascapular muscles are strengthened enough to handle more dynamic open chain exercises, and then modifying that as necessary, not ignoring those compensatory mechanisms or that pain that we see with you know, weighted flexion or abduction or things of that nature. So, references, and then thank you all for listening and staying awake. And we'll open up to questions just.